In February of 2007, the idea of using a PS1 as an audiophile quality CD player was introduced to the general public from the depths of the audio underground. By then hi-fi reviewer for sixmoons.com Jeff Day in a couple of reviews he wrote for the online publication. His buddy, Pete Riggle, uh, Pete Riggle, I like that name, brought over a first gen PS1 model number SCPH-1001 to join the party. Jeff Day said in the article that he had heard rumors of just how good this particular version of the PS1 was when used as a CD player and was curious to give it a listen. He felt this video game player does have outstanding audio performance. He guessed a consumer would have to spend more than $6,000 on a one box CD player to equal, let alone better it. Granted, this was 2007 guys, almost 14 years ago. Times and technology have changed. My goal with this video is to readdress the subject yet again by resurrecting the Sony PS1 SCPH-1001, modding it a little bit with the help of my good buddy Mike Galusha, and hearing for myself whether the claims of the past can withstand the leaps and bounds that the modern day DAC has achieved since the original article was written. Of course, like everything else in the audio world, the claims that this is a giant killer by Mr. Day have come under scrutiny, criticism, and of course, its fair share of trolling by some audio enthusiasts out there. It wouldn't have been a good article had it not received its fair share of doubt and damnation. <laughs> this is the way things are in the audio world. My favorite is always the ones and zeros folks that refuse to believe CD players can sound different. Well, my task for this video is to figure out if this device can compete in the arena of 2022 and whether it's worth buying one of these on the used market and using it as your front end CD player. I will be showing you behind the scenes footage of how we modded it, comparisons with several other CD players, and my subjective review on the sound quality. Let's get to it. I have read almost every publication about using the PS1 as a CD player. One article that caught my eye was one by the late Art Dudley. I want to read an excerpt from his article that completely blew me away. It made me take a step back and think about this whole industry for a second. I have it written right here. I'm gonna go ahead and read it out loud. The preponderance of audio products housed in a thick, machined alloy enclosures that are heavier, fancier, more metallic, and worst of all, much more expensive than they need to be. More expensive often than the parts they enclose is one of the most depressing things about this hobby. Plastic is fine with me. Now, when he was talking about plastic, he was talking about the enclosure that the PS1 comes in. And this really hit home because he was a very, very well-known and renowned audiophile and audio reviewer for Stereophile Magazine, uh, amongst others. And for him to write this, it kind of just kind of puts it out there, you know, that he was aware that there's a lot of stuff out there that's overkill, overdone, overpriced. So I take this and this is, I should honestly, I feel like, printing it out and putting it on my wall. So I always remember um, the, the sense of reason in, in this, in this uh, industry. So just wanted to share that with you really quick. Let's get back to it. Many classic audiophiles and outstanding reviewers have left us. And it saddens me because I love learning about this hobby and this industry from people like Mr. Dudley. I know audio is subjective, but some people deliver the message in such a digestible way that it leaves me feeling educated and entertained by their written word. One of my biggest goals is to perfect the beautiful balance between education and entertainment. Up next, I have a quick one-on-one -on -one with John DeVore, who was responsible for originally sending Mr. Dudley the PS1 to review years and years ago on Stereophile Magazine. Check it out. I'm here with John DeVore from DeVore Fidelity, and he's gonna bring a little bit of information or concerning the ps1 um john so who is john devore and how did you end up in the audio industry and where are you at today 
Uh, John DeVore is the owner and uh, founder of DeVore Fidelity. We're a speaker company. We make speakers in Brooklyn. Um, I've been in the industry a very long time. Uh, I, I've been an audiophile since I was a little kid. And as soon as I graduated from uh, college, I showed up in New York and there was a help wanted store, uh, help wanted sign in a hi-fi store. So that was 1988. So I've uh, essentially, I've been in the industry since 1988. Uh, Divorce Fidelity was started in 2000. Um, so in some manner or other, uh, Devor, uh, John Devore has been in the industry for 40 years now. <laughs> That's just, that's terrifying. No, 35, 35 years about. And uh, with your company, what, what's the main product lines that you offer? Uh, is it speakers, amplifiers, DAX? What do you specialize uh, speak, in? We make, we make speakers. So we've got um, a line of speakers called orangutans and a line of speakers called gibbons. And uh, they're every, all of them are hand-built here in New York, and they're sold through a network of, of dealers and uh, distributors for international. Awesome. Yeah, and we've been kind of chit-chatting via email for the past year and, and just trying to trying to get that right time to actually finally talk. And I'm glad we have that chance now. Um, specifically, uh, I brought you on to talk about the PS1, which is what this video is all about. Um, so when you sent Art Dudley the PS1, uh, yeah. what was your opinion because it may, he kind of made it sound in the article that he, that you had several, but uh, what was your opinion about using it as a main CD player in a hi-fi system? And did you think he was going to love it the way he did? So, uh, so first off, I think um, I can take credit for uh, introducing the PS One to the sort of the mainstream high-end audio folks in the US uh, because I actually used it at uh, a CES as probably 2004 maybe or, or 2003. However, I cannot take credit for being the guy who, who discovered it as a CD player, um, not even in the US. So I found out from a good friend of mine who's also in the industry, Jonathan Halpern, he is Tone Imports. And at the time, uh, we would show at hi-fi shows quite a bit. He imports uh, Shindo Electronics, among a lot of other things. And early on, the first several um, hi-fi shows we did, at Devor Fidelity did as a speaker company, we used a lot of Jonathan Halpern's uh, imported goods. So he he was the first one that I ever know of who, who discovered how amazing the, the PS1 is as a CD player. And I had I got such a kick out of it. So I would never even use digital at hi-fi shows. I would only spin records. But then I just got such a kick out of how good and how subversive the the PS1 thing was that um, in either 2003 or 2004, Jonathan and I had several rooms. And in sort of like a like a, a tertiary demo room with a little pair of uh, my bookshelf speakers and a little integrated amp, I actually stuck a PS1 in a dresser drawer as the source for that room. And and I would just like, I would kind of be like, hey, come, let me let me play you this thing. And I probably, you know, Jonathan and I together probably showed a dozen people that year, that particular system. And that was it, it exploded. Everyone, all, all anyone ever wanted to write about, about that CES was, the fact that that the Devor Fidelity was using a PS1 as their source in the room. Um, it's killer sounding. Uh, I don't know about it. I mean, it, I haven't heard one in 15 years. Mm -hmm. I probably I still have a stack of them. Basically, Art is right. I did have a bunch of them. And that's because even 15 years ago, it was basically on its last legs. So you right. would go on eBay and you would have to buy 10 of them for four bucks each to find three or two that that worked to the level that you need them to work to sound like a great CD player. And I used to just test them. Uh, basically, if the transport would play a CDR, an audio CDR, it was fine. 
if it couldn't play an audio CDR, it probably still could, it would work as a gaming console, but it was junk as a CD player. It, even if it played a regular CD, a Redbook CD, it didn't sound as good as I, it, it could. Now, so basically you'd have to buy a ton of them and throw half of them away <laughs> to get one that worked. They have a lot of uh, replacement uh, transports, uh, the laser and all that on top. Is that what you were, you were talking about? They well, it was just. I mean, I'm talking about a bone stock PS1, first oh, okay. bone stock PS1. So to get one, you know, and and the whole the whole point of the PS1 was to get a ten thousand dollar CD player that cost twenty bucks, mm -hmm. literally. You know, so the I, the whole idea of then you know trying to trans you know put a transport into it or you know trying to trying to tweak it or anything like that. Was and it was absolutely antithetical to what we were doing with the PS One. That was the whole point of it was dirt cheap, and that was it. Um, I, I remember, you know, so so, you know, the, the it it became known that I used it, and Jonathan Halpern used it as a CD player. Uh, I used it as a CD player because I don't, I didn't like CDs. I had no interest in having a CD player. Right. Uh, you know, I had some DAX. I think at the time I probably had a an old modified Wadia, you know, whatever. I mean, I had some decent digital at the time, but it's it didn't do it for me. I, you know, I didn't. It wasn't it wasn't my thing. I I still to this day, the vast majority of my listening is records. Um, Got it. You know, I'd I'd rather listen to a cassette than listen to digital most days of the week. So for me, you know, a PS One was perfect. I would just have it there, plug it in. You cannot turn it off. It takes a month or so to come up to, to temperature really and to sound as good as I know it could sound. And that was it, you know, um, as long as you knew how the how the little controls on the thing worked, skip ahead or fast forward or whatever, you know, that was it. Nice. Um, so, you know, so it was known that I that I used it. And that's why Art contacted me. He maybe he contacted Halpern first and Halpern knew that I had a little stash of them. So, um, so yeah, so he contacted me. So I sent it up and I actually looked around. That was 15 years ago. I actually looked around and I remember I had to, I wrote him a little note, uh, basically instructions, you know, never turn it off, that kind of thing. Use good cables. Uh, don't try to bypass the output stage. That was another little tweak that was out there. You know, people would say that if you use the AV outputs, it bypasses the last op, op amps, does not sound as good. So, you know, basically that, and then a little diagram, which I think they did publish in the magazine. That that uh, drawing is on the uh, the article online. Okay, so they did put it in the magazine. Yeah. yeah. So that was just like this. These are the buttons and how how you can actually navigate a CD. So you are actually the culprit here. You are the one. I, I came. I came to the right person. Yeah, I totally yeah. came to the right person. Yeah, so so when, you, when you told me that you wanted to talk about it. I had to, I dug around and I found <laughs> this is the one that I used to bring to hi-fi shows. So these cases were made, I think by like Blockbuster or. Oh, I got, I got to get a case like somebody that. that used to actually rent them. Right. And these are custom made. So the inside is, you know, vacuum formed for the PS1 and a couple of controllers and cables. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, that's uh, incredible. Oh so yeah, I dug it up. I have no idea if it actually still plays or not, but. Um, that, that's, in, that's incredible that, that, you know, you, uh, now, now did you just discover this by happenstance or, or did you hear it from, did you, I heard it from Jonathan Halpern. Yeah. Tony. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, I believe heard it from, I think it was a thing in Europe first. I think oh. that it came via Europe. Uh, it came via maybe one of the brands that he imported from Germany or something like that. Uh, but Jonathan Halpern is the guy, he is the, uh, he's the point man for the U.S. <laughs> for the, yeah, the and, and, until those articles got uh, posted, um, it was kind of a hush hush thing. Nobody really knew about it. You guys obviously were using it in, in you know hi fi shows and stuff, but it wasn't like this mass hysteria of hi fi. You know, um, right. well, it was also 15 years ago, so internet was not it. It wasn't nearly as buzzy as it is now. Sure, uh, and also it's like. Like part of the reason that that we put the PS1 in a drawer at CES was, you know, I'm not in this to to piss people off, you know. So I don't I don't want to like make enemies of people who make 
high end audio, high end CD players or DAX or anything like that. Sure. No. So it, I wasn't trying to like, you know, blow the industry up. It's not my, that, that's not my goal. Um, but I wasn't trying to like hide it specifically either. So, yeah, I mean, you, you know, even if I have a YouTube channel now, if, if I had a YouTube channel 15 years ago, if so, whatever the equivalent would have been, uh, a tele YouTube, a, a telegraph channel, I don't think I would have been talking about it then either. Just, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of grief, you know, for not yeah. a lot of payback, right? It, I don't have anything to gain from people. Sure. I mean, you know? it's not, it's not your particular product. So it's not like you're going to be promoting right. it and stuff yeah. like and that. And even without talking about it, everyone was emailing me asking which particular model that I had to find. And, you know, what do I recommend? What kind of cables or, you know, have you tried putting, uh, these new old stock capacitors in there, you know, whatever. It's like, nope, never tried any of that shit. <laughs> I did try swapping caps. I tried bypassing stuff. I even tried, there was a guy, you know, again, 15 years ago, there was a guy who was very well known at the time. He's still in the industry, but he was very well known at the time for making battery powered um, amps and preamps. Hmm. And he showed up, I think it was at Michael Lavornia's house. I had, you know, Lavornia used a, a PS1 too. Mm -hmm. for many years um, as a reviewing tool. And uh, it was there. And and so this guy showed up with a big battery power supply for the PS1. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we sat down, we listened to it, and it was absolutely better in every way stock than it was with the big battery power, powered pass, you know, bypass. So it's just like, you know, the theory of the, of um, some of the smartest people that I knew at the time made sense to me and it's that you know sony is an engineering powerhouse and there are a lot of brilliant motherfuckers who work at sony and who have worked at sony for a very you know over the years for the whole time that sony's existed mm -hmm. you know sony is responsible for inventing a lot of amazing stuff and you know for one reason or another marketing it so poorly that it just becomes extinct but they still have the engineering chops that really almost nobody else has i don't i'm not talking about maybe today but certainly 15 years ago yes and so you know the ps1 the first generation ps1 was a massive investment for sony and they had they had designers and engineers on it that every other you know any high end audio company in the on the planet would be drooling to have i mean there's resources that no none, none of them ever would have sure and so, um, and looking at the inside of, of a PS1, there's no question that Sony was losing money on every single one they sold of that, only the very first generation one with the analog RCA outputs. Mm -hmm. They were losing money on every single one that they sold and it didn't matter because they needed it to, to leverage uh, Nintendo, you know, to get in with Nintendo and Atari and all this other stuff that they were kind of competing against out of nowhere. Right. And so, I, you know, that's that's the theory of, the, of why it was so over engineered and sounded so remarkable uh, as a CD player. Good. Um, you know, well, my final question to you, good sir, is do you still feel this unit is relevant despite all the te technological <laughs> advances we have in hi-fi today? I know uh, there's a few companies that still put out some really amazing, you know, CD players and CD transports and stuff. Do you think the PS1 can still stand its ground with what we have today? I honestly have no idea. I haven't heard any of mine in 15 years. Um, I think so. But but if we talk about 15 years ago, it was already, a, you know, there was already technological advancements. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the you know, the 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 apogee of the of the standalone CD player may very well have been 15 years ago. I don't know if it's, you know, it's possible that, that CD players are, are better today than they were 15 years ago. I don't know. I don't listen to CD players. Gotcha. But the fact that the Sony PS1 15 years ago sounded better in real ways, you know, it's the Sony never, you know, if you stuck it in a high-end audio showroom and you played it back to back to back with, state-of-the-art digital 15 years ago, 
I would say, you know, nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 customers would not pick the PS1. Mm -hmm. The PS1's strengths were about listening to a long term. They were it was they were quiet strengths. They were strengths of of not doing anything wrong and of a seamlessness. And, you know, the strengths that the Sony had or and has, I assume, still today are not the kinds of strengths that people write about easily. And it's, you know, I think R. Dudley struggled with that and was able to communicate that to some extent. And he was he was a, a very appropriate writer to write about it because he's not the kind of guy who would have been impressed by the, you know, the flash in a pan, you know, digital player that everyone was talking about and everyone had to have 15 years ago who the company doesn't even exist now, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so my guess is that it probably still holds its own in a, in a certain way, but it's in a certain, you know, quiet, understated way that may not be for anyone or, or, any, or most people, certainly <laughs> it's not what people are looking for. Absolutely. Um, understandably, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's interesting when I, when I first heard about it, I was, I was like, what? You know, I, and I know there's always, you know, these little underground things that people try. You know, I, <clears throat> I heard there's a out there, there's an Optimus uh, portable CD player that people are, are saying is, you know, super audiophile quality and stuff like that. I mean, That's a transport only, though. That was the funny thing about that. Is really? That was, all, that was a weird trend. I think that was probably Sam Telig started that one. That was um, that was a trend that was probably a decade before the PS1. Right. But that was, yeah, that was used. Oh, you know what? Dick Sequera invented a, a, a basically a, it was a base that was the, tr it became a power supply and a, a digital out for the, for that stupid Radio Shack uh, portable disc player. Yeah. I mean, whatever. It's like people have been excited to find sideways hacks forever. Mm -hmm. um, by the time you got the Dick Sequera, platform and then connected to to a deck you'd spent 10 times more than a you know whatever the equivalent you know california audio lab cd player of the time would have been anyway so you know sure. whatever it's much more about having fun and about maybe thumbing your nose at the industry than it is about really looking for the best possible sounding thing you can find you know whatever Absolutely. and Kelly was very good at that back in his day as well so <laughs> awesome uh, well, I, I definitely want to have you back for a, a high five hour segment, and I, you know, I'd love to talk more about your company and what you do, and because uh, what caught my eye was a particular uh, YouTube video you did a while back, probably about a year, year and a half ago, and uh, I, 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 since then I've definitely looked up to you as <clears throat> one of those people that are that tell it how it is, you know, that don't you know sugarcoat anything, that you you speak your mind and you're not afraid to. So uh, I appreciate that about you. I think we need more people like you in the industry. Um, and thank you for your time. And I, 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 I'm sure it was, a, you know, an honor to be around all of these uh, amazing, uh, you know, reviewers and, and, and audio files of the past. It's sad that we're seeing a lot of them go. Um, yes. But I, I'm, I'm, I am forward thinking about the fact that there are new generations coming that will hopefully appreciate uh, what you guys have all built, you know? So, uh, thank you again for your time, John. And, um, we're going to get back to the video. This model PS1 features RCA outputs and a proprietary AV out. However, the grand consensus is that the RCA outs sound way better. So we will be using RCA cables from AudioQuest to connect this unit to my Cambridge Evo 150. Inside the unit, you will find a KSM 440 transport, basic transport that can be easily replaced for under 40 bucks. 
nothing really super special there. The SCPH-1001 model comes with an AKM AK4309 AVM 16-bit Sigma Delta DAC chip, which is considered the secret sauce that provides the PS1's particular sound, but has audio files not only curious, but also using it in their front end system regularly. Sony is known to overbuild their first few batches of products in a new line and then cut out the good stuff later on, which I am guessing is what happened here with the SCPH-1001. I did learn a little life hack along the way. Uh, you can actually plug in a PS2 remote and use the bottom of the controls to navigate through the interface. This is cool because it's cordless, so I am not beholden to the old corded controller. Very cool. Now you know. So what exactly did I do to this unit? Obviously you could see that there had been some, some modifications. You know, after studying up a little bit on the project, I felt the simple switch mode power supply was going to be an obstacle, especially as a noise pollutant. So I contacted my good friend, Mike Galusha, and we decided to build a linear power supply that will hopefully lessen the amount of noise this machine puts out. Let's be clear. John Atkinson measured this unit years ago, and it measured horribly, but he then followed up by saying it sounded terrific. The trouble in talking about these things is that we measure, what we measure doesn't always correlate with what we hear. I don't necessarily follow measurements like gospel. Still, they are an excellent way to see if you can hear if what you hear is backed up by science or if, you know, in some instances, the subjective opinion of a listener can be completely different than one what's on the screen. So in the following clip, I will show you how Mike and I worked some magic on the PS1. Check it out. Hi, I'm Mike and uh, I'm helping uh, Mike with a uh, Sony PS1. This is a linear power supply for it, uh, meaning it is not a switch mode power supply. It uses traditional transformers, rectification, diodes, filtering. Uh, he found the specs for what was required for the PS1 on a website with some power supply designs. And this is similar to that. It's not identical, but it's pretty similar because they're, they're all pretty similar. It has, you've got a transformer, you've got diodes, some filtering um, and then uh, adjustable regulators. This uses LM317 regulators, which are very, very common adjustable regulator. Uh, one side puts out 7.6 volts at one amp. The other side is 3.6 volts at a half an amp. Um, both of those are a little more than is necessary to run this, which is good. You've got to have a little bit of safety margin, not so much safety, but a little headroom. Um, so they use, uh, both use what's called a CRC power supply, which is a capacitor resistor capacitor, helps reduce ripple uh, and noise. Um, it's not very efficient, um, but it's much quieter than a typical, especially old switch mode power supply. And uh, that's what it should do for a benefit on this. This has, um, and I don't know exactly how old this is, 20 or 30 years probably. Um, it has a built-in internal switch mode power supply. Modern ones can be exceptionally good. Like uh, the stuff that's in, in modern DACs and power amps, they're superbly quiet. But old ones were not, and cheap ones are still not. Um, you plug one in and you can get noise on your analog outputs just by having something plugged in that's crappy. Um, Ikea stuff. <laughs> It's a good example. Uh, anyway, so we're going to take the PS1 apart. We're going to wire in this pigtail. This pigtail plugs into the linear supply. Um, it's got four conductors, so one for each voltage. And um, hopefully it makes it better. I do have measurement capabilities, but I don't have a test CD anymore. I used to years ago, but I haven't actually measured a CD player in probably 10 years <laughs> because there's not a lot of them and I still have one I just it, it gets fed into a DAC I don't actually use the CD I use the transport mechanism but I don't use the DAC in it because uh, my I like the holo DAC a lot and that's what I'm currently using um, but anyway we can before we do this and I'll, I'll probably do it really quick maybe Mike will get it on camera is I'll hook this up to the audio analyzer and we'll just see what the noise floor is it may or may not change it will probably change how it sounds. It may not change the noise floor on the measurement, but it probably will. Um, anyway, we'll uh, get set up and... 
take it apart. This is the FFT trace of the output of the Sony CD player. This is like a 60, this is your 60 Hertz because we're in the US. That's the power supply filtering. It's um, pretty noisy. Um, so that'd be 120, 180. So all of this basically is power supply noise um, and based off of 60 Hertz. Uh, I don't have a, a way to put a test tone into this. So all we really can see is this FFT of, of that. And uh, this is the output in millivolts, but it's not staying stable. I can hear the analyzer clicking over there because there's just so much noise. Um, then you can ignore the THD because there's just, just noise, lots of noise. So this is like minus 28. I'll give you a comparison. If I plug my Holo Audio Spring 3 DAC in there, this is at minus 130. <laughs> so it's about 100 dB worse. So this gives us a baseline of uh, where to go or what we have now. So we'll, we'll uh, hook up the linear power supply and see if this improves because this is pretty bad. So this is your power switch. You will no longer have a power switch on the front. You will have to use this guy on the back of that because this sits right under the button. You will also not have that power LED. Do you really want one? No. We could make one, but it's a lot more hacking. <laughs> so. Cool. So what we're going to do is so we need to basically we need to we're going to run this in to where the AC went. It's a little bit big, but that's OK. Um, what I'll probably do is drill a little hole through here, put a zip tie in. That way it it uh, keeps us from pulling out. Actually, do it right here and um, yeah, all we got to do is solder this in there. And actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, you don't care about this, right? No. It's going to come back because I'm going to cut these wires and then s splice it. That way we can just plug it yeah, in. Right, perfect, yeah. yeah, then there's no, because trying to solder those to that is just not good mojo at all. <laughs> That's a good sign. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's a good sign. You said you got a little green alien glow in there. So, go down. so we go down CD player and X. X. So it's still pretty bad. So I wonder if it's picking up something from somewhere else. Well, actually it's a lot better. Well, it's not a lot better. It's some better. This was at 20, was it 24 before? 28? Yeah, well, anyway, I know this was at 36 millivolts. Now it's at 20, 21. That's really so good. We, we lost, I think this was 20, 28. So that'd be about 4 dB. Whoa. Yeah, so the biggest part was the TV. So now we're at 400 microvolts and we went down to 77, 78. So there's, there's a lesson. Do not plug the crappy TV in while listening to music. <laughs> so is that what's on the screen right now really good? It's pretty good. It's not great, but it's pretty good. It's way better than what it was, but then again, I didn't, didn't think to take that away. I'm, that, and that's my fault. Um, so let's put this down on the floor just to get it away from it. Plug it in. No, it's 20 millivolts. It is... It might actually be coming in through the video line because it's still much better than what it was. Right. Um, but this, this thing, it's hard to say whether it's this power supply right. or um, just noise being generated by the monitor. Well, here, let's just do this. 
and it's feeding in through the video cable. Okay, so um, unfortunately, and I didn't even cross my mind before we started this, would be to unplug the monitor from the PS2 um, because that monitor is the biggest source of noise. But we did pick up about, and I, I'd had, we, he, Mike's going to look at the thing. He could correct me if I'm wrong. We either picked up about 4 dB um, signal to noise ratio or we picked up about 8 <laughs> depending on what it, what it was. But we definitely went from 36 millivolts of noise to 20. So that's that's almost 50% better. That's probably if it was double it would be 6 dB. So we probably picked up about 4 dB. Um, that's if with it plugged in. However, unplugging the monitor from the uh Unplugging this little monitor from the PS2 uh, drops it dramatically and it goes down to about 400 microvolts and it goes down to about minus 75 dB signal noise floor. So it is much better. That monitor is, is apparently injecting a lot of noise in through the composite video input to the PS2. Um, other ones may not do that. I have no other source. I don't have anything with a composite video output. There's an old VCR, maybe, but <laughs> but you couldn't. It wouldn't work, right? Um, uh, so, and unplugging the monitor while it's plugged in does drop the noise. So it's not it's not picking up noise from the monitor being plugged in per se. So it's not environmental noise. It's something in the monitor either generating the noise or the cheesy power supply generating the noise. My suggestion is right now, start the CD plane and unplug it. <laughs> so um, we did pick up about 4 dB signal to noise ratio. Uh, it may have been more than that and been masked by the crappy monitor supply. I Unfortunately, we did not test that and reverting this would be a lot of work it's possible but it's a lot of work so um the good part is is it all seems to be working this doesn't get warm it's nice and cold uh, it'll eventually get a little warm but i've i have i've tested it and it, it it'll it'll run all day long at an amp of power and not get hot so um, we're good all right folks so now that you know what we did and roughly how the noise floor measured it's time to share my opinion of how it sounded the PS1 is constrained in both the frequency extremes and with the dynamic range in my system. It's not perfect. However, the sound is smooth, open, and detailed. The PS1 is mellow and easy to listen to without fatiguing you even after running it for hours. It's probably the most analog sounding digital device I have ever heard. Weird, I know. <laughs> it's possible that the dynamic range compression, especially in the leading edge of treble transients, could add to its perceived smoothness possibilities. A component's transient response will affect hearing some sounds as colored, damped, or assertive and aggressive. In this case, it seemed to have dulled the sound a bit. Some components have a sound that leaps out at you in a very violent way, but not the PS1. It's as steady as a train. I enjoy listening to a few soundtracks on this device, especially Interstellar. The bass was actually nice and, and punchy, but not overwhelming to the point that it overpowers the rest of the instruments. It's mellow. It's a very natural sound. I am on board with using this as a front end solution for your CD playing needs if you can get over the fact that you need to memorize the interface controls to use it without a screen. It's, it's kind of a, kind of a buzzkill there. Unless you somehow integrate a screen into the a custom enclosure, but to be honest, it, I don't think it's worth that much trouble. I think what Mike and I did was just enough to give it a lower noise floor. As you saw in the previous clip, adding a screen caused all sorts of chaos and mayhem within the measurements. Now you might be curious how it compared to my other CD players, like my Premier Transport or my Cambridge, uh, or my vintage Pioneer, even the Lingdorf. Well, all my friends, technology has done its job. The newer players sounded richer and much nicer, much brighter and dynamic range was there. The Premier, for example, was very detailed. I won't say the PS1 didn't compete with them. It most definitely did, 
it just didn't go that extra mile like the others. It's toned down a bit. However, the Pioneer had a very similar sound to the PS1, because it's, it's an older unit, it's from the 90s. Very tame and neutral. It's a, the simple conclusion is that the unit doesn't have all the fancies that the newer CD players have. Before its time, the PS1, in my opinion, slays as a CD player. I think if you are up for the task and you want a fun project, this is still a rele relevant unit to buy in the used market where you can find a clean unit for under 100 bucks on eBay. The PS1 doesn't have any business sounding as good as it does, which makes it one of the happiest accidents in the audio world. I would love to continue this conversation, so if you would like to make your way to my private Facebook group, Hi-Fi Audio Addiction, so we can talk more about the infamous PS1. Uh, if you enjoyed the video and want to consume more of my content, I invite you to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button, please. If you are looking for a new wardrobe, I do have the most extensive audiophile approved clothing store online and all the links are in the description below. Thanks for watching and I will see you soon. Take care.